On this episode of Table Talk Live, a Mahjong-centric variety show, I'm going to be sharing some thoughts that I've had on how to handle a losing streak. If you have any questions through this presentation, write them in caps. That way we won't miss them. This is going to be an interactive show, so I hope that you join in through live chat. Welcome. Welcome to Table Talk Live. It's just me tonight. I've been working on this presentation for a little while, and I actually didn't plan it for this particular time, but I think it applies no matter when in the year it is, whether it coincides with the new card or not. I think a lot of people might be struggling with the new card, so maybe some will find encouragement through it. How's everybody doing? Thanks for coming, Terry. Evelyn, good to see you here. Pamela, Marnie. Hi, Linda. How's everybody doing with the new card? Hi, Martha, welcome. Can everybody hear me okay? Hi, Irene. Hi, Carol, welcome. Carol from Chicago. Hi, Shell, good to see you here. Can y'all hear me okay? Okay, uh, oh, the card is hit and miss. Okay, yeah. Okay, Linda says, this is my first new card, and it's traumatic. <laughs> Okay, well, maybe some of the things that I share tonight can give you a little encouragement. We're all kind of struggling. It, it's, it's kind of the nature of the beast. When the new card comes out, everybody struggles for the first couple of weeks, maybe a month, depending on how often you play. And most of us are playing online or playing solitaire. Evelyn thinks that the patterns on the card are gorgeous. Hi, Chris. Welcome, JL. Good to have you here. I'm going to be sharing some thoughts tonight on how to handle a losing streak. If you all have any input along the way, please put it in the chat because I'm just sharing my thoughts. I'm sure everybody else has their own way to cope. So I, I hope that uh, whatever I share will bring some encouragement to you. Oh yeah, Terry says she started in October. Everyone else knew the card well. Well, yeah, it's kind of the great equalizer when the new card comes out. Maya, by the time that you play with your regular group, you'll you'll know the card and you'll be doing just fine. Hi, Linda, thank you. <laughs> and you guys would get a kick on how I do my, my thumbnails. I, I just do a bunch of selfies and make a bunch of faces. And I think about things like this, like what in the world am I gonna do, you know? And I just have the camera clicking off photos and I just kind of keep what I think is best and most useful with different things that come up when I do these videos. Hi, Karen. Okay, you'll be driving soon, but you'll be listening. No worries. It'll be descriptive. I do have some visuals, but you can always watch the repost. Oh, thank you, Martha. Yes, yes, they're new. They're bigger, bigger around. They, they have kind of the same shape, but they're different, and they hurt my nose. <laughs> They have those, you know, the little pads. I'm not used to them, so it hurts my nose. I have to get used to them. 
All right, shall we get started with the presentation? Anybody just joining us, tonight's episode on Table Talk Live is going to be talking about how to handle a losing streak. These are my thoughts along the way. Feel free to share your thoughts as well. And then depending on the time, we'll open it up to Q&A and discussion. Yep, Sharon says, hopefully by the time we play in person, everyone will be acclimated to the new card. We'll be able to hit the ground running. I think so. But some, some people don't play online, so for them, I think it's going to be a challenge. For people who play online, I think we're going to hit the ground running. All right, well, let, let's get going with this presentation. My hope is that we'll get through all this within an hour. I'm hoping it won't go more than an hour, but... Um, I'm not sure because I've never done this presentation before, but I think it's pretty short and to the point. I have four main points. Okay, Chris says, I usually cry and cuss terribly. Uh-oh. <laughs> All right, well, we'll see how it goes here. Hopefully this will help. Let's get to the presentation, okay? Oh, wait. Oui. Uh, Evelyn says, sometimes I wonder if some of the better players have some prognostication abilities or psychic abilities. I don't think so. I, I think it'd be a rarity. But I do have some thoughts on that. Remind me, Evelyn, because if you are, if you have empathic abilities and if you are, if you, if you have keen awareness you can pick up on tells. There are a lot of tells that go on at a table, at a live game anyway. You can watch body language, facial expressions, flinches, mumblings, groanings, complainings, those verbal tells. You can get a lot of information. I have a, a set of videos on tells. So look for those. I think I call it At the Table. It's, the series is called At the Table. So um, check it out. I'll try to remember to put, put a um, link in the video description because if you're on a losing streak, you can use some of those tells to help you get an advantage. Yes, you have to know your, the players because they could be sending you on a goose chase. Okay, let's get started, shall we? I want to first say thank you to the moderators who are joining us. I really appreciate your help and support through these live streams, especially tonight, because I'm going to be looking at this presentation, and I might miss some things in chat. All right, onward, here we go. How to handle the losing streak. This is my presentation part. I will be looking at chat every now and again, but I'd like to try to get through the presentation and then we can have Q&A and, and discussion around these things. Here we go. So first, let's have a reality check. Mahjong is a complex game and it takes time to master. Every version of Mahjong is complex, even Hong Kong Mahjong, which is the easiest version to learn. But there are some complexities even with that ground level game. So keep that in mind. Try not to be so hard on yourself. It's a complex game. The more you play, the better you'll get. So if you are new, try to give yourself some grace. It takes time to master the game. Eventually, you're going to experience a losing streak. I guarantee it. Discouragement can set in, and it can affect the way you play. Poker players call that going on tilt. I have a video on that, by the way. Tilt, it can mess you up, so be careful. Let's talk about ways that you can handle a losing streak. First, rest. When it gets bad, especially. Sometimes you can feel a losing streak coming on, but you can pull out of it. But when it gets bad, 
You need to rest. Take a break from the game. This is when it's starting to affect your attitude. You go, maybe you go to the game and you're grumpy and you haven't even started playing yet. Has anybody ever felt that way? I have. I was in a three week losing streak once and it really started to discourage me. That was time for me to take a break. That's a red flag when you start going to a game and you have an attitude before you even play. While you are on break from the game, you stop playing for, I don't know, a week or two. It's all up to you in that regard. But while you're on break, think about your why. Why do you play the game? For me, I play the game because it exercises my brain. It keeps me active and it allows me to be in a social setting because I work from home. I'm virtual. I work in a... I have a virtual job, so I don't get out much. So one of the reasons why I like to play is because it helps me to stay social and make friends and interact with people instead of being virtual 24-7. Um, so that, those are my whys. It works my brain, and it helps me be social and make friends. Examine your attitude. This is where that red flag comes in. If you get an attitude before you even get to the game, that should be a red flag that you're on tilt and you need to rest from the game. You've got to manage your expectations. And this kind of goes back to the fact that the game is complex and there are a lot of variables that happen during a game that can affect its outcome every single game. So, you got to reassess while you're resting. You're away from the game. You're going to reassess. And this is going to help you adjust your attitude. The first thing you're going to assess is your skills. So, you're going to, let me see here. Do we have a question? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Hi, Jingles. So while you're resting, you're going to reassess and you're going to take a look at your skills. And this is, you're going to have to be objective and try to, to look at yourself from the outside in. And you might even think about asking a friend about your skills. Try not to take it personally, but ask them, do you think I'm a good player? Where do you think I could improve? And then even if they're 5% true, whatever they say, you can learn from that input. So while you're assessing your skills, your skills consider where you are in knowing the card. Now, right now, we have a brand new card, so we're just getting to know it. So we're going to circle back to this, knowing the card. This is one of the things you're going to assess. You're going to think about, am I able to identify the strength in a dealt hand? Because really that's the first step in picking, a, picking a, a direction to go, what category to play or maybe even what hand to play. How are your skills in identifying the strength in a hand? Do you just look for a suit and play that or do you pick a hand right away and stick with that? These are some of the things you want to keep in mind. If you look for the strength in the hand, whether it be multiples or the predominant pattern, are you able to do that? So you're going to think about what are my skills in this regard. Then you're going to assess your abilities in picking a hand. Do you feel that you have uh, the ability to pick a hand and actually see it through to a win? Are, are you needing to improve your abilities in identifying the strength in a dealt hand or even picking a hand? And then using strategies. There are all kinds of strategies and strategies are really guidelines. They're not cut and dry and they're very situational. Are you able to apply strategies against the right piece of your hand or time in the game. Uh, there are a lot of different situations to think about when applying strategies with Mahjong. So once you have 
looked at these different skill sets, you're going to think about what is your comfort level with each of them because that's going to kind of quantify where you need to target improvement. So, for example, knowing the card. If you feel like you have a weakness and, and you're not comfortable navigating the card, you might try some category modeling where you build every hand in the card. Get your tiles out and build every hand in the card. Read the parentheses and make changes to every hand based on those limitations and flexibilities that you're given in the parentheses. So when you're studying the card, that's one way to do it. Category modeling, and I have a video on how to do that. Identifying the strength in a dealt hand. The exercise that's really good for this one is random pulls. You just get 13 or 14 random tiles, find the strength in the dealt hand, throw the tiles in and do it again, and just practice. If, this, if you find that this might be uh, an uncomfortable phase of the game, when you first get those drawn tiles, do you feel anxious? Are you confident? Or do you lack confidence? So if you lack confidence, do those random pulls to build your confidence, identifying the strength in your hand. And then as far as picking a hand, one thing you could do is the category modeling exercises. This is a great way to go through the Charleston and help you build a hand and eventually pick a hand, maybe towards the end of the Charleston. And then using strategies. If you have a hard time using strategies and knowing when to apply it, Think about one of the strategies that I actually adhere to myself is strategy by wall. This is a strategy that I learned from Tom Sloper's website and I've adopted it into my own style of play and I've added some of my own strategies to it. And I think it is an amazing strategy. I have a video on this, so I'll try to have a link in the video description below for that. So as you're assessing your, your skill sets, trying to figure out what your, skill, what your comfort level is, and then build where you find weaknesses. So once you have identified those comfort levels, you're going to be able to see where your weaknesses are. Then you're going to improve your weaknesses by doing these hands-on exercises, and also playing online is going to help a lot. Leverage your strengths. So, for example, your strength might be that you know the card pretty well, but that maybe you're just not picking the right hand and you're getting tiles for something that you maybe should have been playing. So just try to assess and figure out where your skills are lacking and where you're, you're uncomfortable with these skills so that you can leverage your strengths and improve those weaknesses through exercises. I want to touch on luck in a minute, but I want to check up on chat. How's everybody doing so far with what I'm sharing? Is that ringing a chord with any of you? Or striking a chord, I guess, is what it is? Flexibility, Sharon says, I think a good skill to learn is to be flexible in case you need to change your mind. Yep. Okay. Flexibility is key. I think we're going to talk about that. Um, I'm not sure if that is in this particular presentation, but I have a, a video on style of play. And we talk about fixed style of play versus adaptive, which is more flexible. So we can talk about that later, but let's talk about luck and skill. The difference between skill and luck. And in Mahjong, it is a game of skill. It is, and it's, it's a game that requires intellect. You've got a, it's a thinking game, but there is always an element of skill because it's a game. It's a game of skill with an element of luck. So 
let's talk about about the luck aspect of mahjong. So some people think that it's 50-50. 50% skill, 50% luck. What do you guys think? What are what is your your thoughts on this? Do you think it's 50-50? Do you think it's um, you know, 25-75, so 25% skill and 75% luck? What are your thoughts on it? Write it in chat. Seventy-five twenty-five. Uh, Pamela says. So, do you think it's seventy-five percent skill and twenty-five percent luck? Hi, Loretta. Welcome. We're talking about losing streak tonight. Uh, more, more skill than luck. Twenty-five skill. Tw uh, seventy-five percent skill. Twenty-five percent luck. Terry says seventy percent skill, 30 percent luck. Depends on what I get in the deal, Cindy says. 50-50, says Carol. I have heard 80 percent luck, says Martha. The Charleston gives you a boost, 60-40. Marnie says 80 percent skill, 20 percent luck. It's interesting, everybody's kind of circled in around 75, 25, 60, 40, 50, 50. Okay, interesting. So, Here's what I think. You ready for it? I think it depends on where you are on the spectrum between beginner and advanced. When you are a beginner, I think that you have a greater proportion of luck than skill. And it depends on where you are. If you're a brand new beginning player, you're gonna rely a lot on luck because you haven't gained experience through play. The more you play, the better you get. The more you learn, the more you know what to expect through uh, what players typically pass or won't pass. And maybe even your particular group, you might get to know how people pass tiles. So that's an element to consider as well, knowing your players at the table if you play with a regular group. So I think that it depends on how much of a beginner you are. The, the, the further you are on the beginner side, the more luck than you, that you are gonna have as compared to skill. Conversely, the more advanced you are, the less luck and more skill because you have years of experience in understanding the complexities of the game. You know year to year that the combinations on the cards themselves change, but the strategies can all be applied. So you're going to be able to leverage everything that you've learned from year to year, and that builds your abilities, that builds on your skill level, and so less luck is involved. There will always be an element of luck, but I think the more advanced you are as a player, the more experience you gain, the less luck has to do with the way you play the game. So I wouldn't even put a number on it, but I suppose if you look at this visual, that for an advanced player, 80-20, 80% skill, 20% luck. You've got to know what to do with the tiles that you get, and you've got to be able to watch what's happening at the table. You've got to watch the discards. You've got to watch the exposures. You've got to look at body language. You've got to see what's happening and be aware of what is happening at the table and all that is skill that is gained through experience and has less to do with luck and more to do with awareness, knowledge. And as we know, knowledge is power. Welcome, Tracy. So this is my take on skill and luck. So considering that, let's talk about the things that you can't control when you're playing the game. You cannot control effects caused by your opponents. For example, if you're playing with a beginner and it's in the end game and they discard a flower as their last tile, one of your opponents is ready to win on a flower 
and that beginner just tossed a flower. Well, you can't control that. That's going to be something that occurs whether or not you consider that good luck, bad luck. It's good luck for your opponent, bad luck for you. But you can't control that. Picking the right tiles at the right time. This is where some of the luck comes in. If you don't get the right tiles at the right time, it can hurt, especially if those tiles are singles or pairs. If you're playing a pair hand and someone, let's say you're playing the big ear hand and someone puts up a Kong of twos, you're in trouble. You gotta switch your hand. If you don't get those tiles before they're able to build their hand, that would be an example of not picking the right tiles at the right time. So let's talk now about what you can control. You can improve your weaknesses. That goes back to that assessment. Look at that list and decide where your weaknesses are. Also, you want to make sure that you're objective and even get some input from your friends. What are my weaknesses and what are my strengths? Improve your weaknesses, leverage your strengths. Also, monitor your triggers. And this talks a lot about, this goes into tilt, because there are certain things that might happen at the table that can cause you to go on tilt. So know what your triggers are. One of my triggers, and I, I'll be honest here, one of my triggers in a live game is table talk. When people start saying things at the table, that give people information about their hand, whether it's tiles in their hand or tiles not in their hand. For example, where are all the jokers? Or where are the flowers? I can't, I can't buy a flower or I can't buy a joker. These are some of the things that can put me on tilt because it's going to give my opponents information and it could, it could impact my own hand if other players are aware of those verbal tells. Also, control your feelings. So if you are triggered, breathe. Try not to go on tilt. Try to bring yourself back to a place of, of calm, confident, cool, collected, and confident. Bring yourself back. So let's just recap there. Improve your weaknesses, leverage your strengths, Monitor your triggers. You got to know what your triggers are, though, and then control your feelings. So, if you feel yourself going on tilt, you got to bring yourself back. W one of the things that I tell myself if I find myself getting frustrated is I say to myself, Enjoy the journey. Enjoy the journey because every hand in Mahjong is a journey. Everyone is different, just a little bit. I mean, yes, we're playing on a card from year to year and um, these patterns are different from year to year but sometimes it, just with the different variations that can occur every hand is different so just enjoy the journey watch it unfold enjoy the journey so that's what I say to myself if I feel myself getting a little frustrated or something like that. I try to find a little jewel along the way for that particular hand, especially if it goes bad. So after you have rested and reassessed, you're going to return to the game. Let me check on chat and see if I've missed anything here. Uh, let's see. Sounds like life, somebody says. Taking advantage of someone tossing a flower. Yeah, well, if you can, that's great. Um, skill of not playing with a beginner. <laughs> okay. Do you watch other players' eyes on their cards? Typically, I'm watching my own card and my own hand, but you know, if, if you're playing with someone who points at the card, it's a little hard to not notice. Okay, so I'm just checking to see if I've missed anything. 
Oh, okay, Evelyn says, I never ceases to be amazed when a hand looks bleak and then all of a sudden it comes in. Yep. All right, so let's talk about returning to the game. So when you're getting ready to go back to playing after taking a rest from the game, reassessing your skills, you're going to come back and you're going to remember your why. So on your way to your first game after taking a rest, think about your why. Why do you play the game? I play because it exercises my brain and I can make friends and socialize and get out of the house and be with people. That's my why. So remember your why. Ease into the game. So play some, some easy hands. Play consecutive run or play pung pung kong kong. That's, that's going to be the easiest shape to, to play and potentially win because you don't need you don't have any pairs or singles you can use any number of jokers in there if anybody puts up pungs or kongs with jokers and whatnot it it will have little effect on your hand because you can use jokers to help you uh, where your tiles are either going down or up in exposure so ease into the game don't return to the game and start playing singles and pairs ease into it play consecutive run or play hands that maybe don't use flowers, singles, and pairs. Also, another thing that you can do when you return is try different styles of play. So for example, if you are used to picking a hand right away when you get your tiles, try an adaptive style of play where you don't pick a hand. Gather tiles for the category pick a hand when you run out of discards. So that would be an example of trying a different style of play. Now you're going that would be a push. You're going to be pushing yourself to try something new, but it may be a good way to return to a game after a break. Also test strategies while you're away. That can be one of the things that you're going to do while you're improving on your weaknesses if strategies is one of your weaknesses. You're going to be practicing at home. When you come back to the game, try to apply some of those strategies that you will have learned. Also, manage your expectations. And this goes back to the game of Mahjong, that it is complex. It is a complex game, and it takes a while to master. And there is an element of luck involved. There are things that you can control, and there are things that are not in your control. So you've got to manage your expectations. In closing, pursue excellence with tenacity. Accept failure with dignity. Embrace success with humility. I hope you guys enjoyed the presentation, how to handle a losing streak. Rest, reassess. Did I miss it? What did I miss? Rest, reassess, return. Maybe it was only three things. All right, so let me catch up on chat. Uh, Cindy says, how can you politely tell others about a trigger? You mean like if somebody else gets triggered? Are you, talk, are you kind of talking about poor sportsmanship when you see poor sportsmanship at the table? Seeing somebody else going on tilt? Thank you, Pamela. How do you politely tell others about trigger? your own trigger. Um, I wouldn't tell everybody about my triggers. Well, I kind of just did in this video. <laughs> everybody knows now one of my triggers. But I tend to keep my triggers to myself because then I'll feel subconscious. But I might tell a very close friend about my triggers. And maybe they could help monitor if I'm going on tilt and maybe help me find my center again. So maybe tell a really close friend what your triggers are. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. What am I missing here? When players don't stop talking during the game, maybe it, maybe in it kind of bothers you. 
when people don't stop talking during the game. I don't mind if people talk during the game because part of the game is that it's social. What bothers me is when they talk about the game in play, their tiles, or what's going down, or what's exposed, what's on somebody's rack, or what somebody else discarded that might have affected somebody else. For example, if somebody discarded, let's say somebody, let's say for example, that there's a joker in an exposure and somebody discards the natural tile. And somebody would say, hey, you missed a joker. Okay, that's gonna cause me to go on tilt because that is information that can affect the other players at the table. It's gonna put the attention on that player who did not make that exchange. It could be a mistake, in which case I would be embarrassed. It could be intentional. Maybe I'm playing a pair hand and now everybody's eyes are on me and my pair hand. So when people talk about the game in play, that puts me on tilt because I think it's bad form. Talk about life, talk about family, friends, entertainment, things like that, but don't talk about the game in play because that gives away information to the players at the table if they're aware. And they can use that to their advantage and could end up hurting me as the as a player or somebody else chatting non-stop is a lot oh let's see chatting non-stop through is a lot of if i'm concentrating yep yeah and some when that happens some people just say can we quiet down for a minute i'm i, I need to concentrate or something like that there's nothing wrong with that just telling people that you need you know the chatter to calm down a little so you can concentrate that's okay. Uh, let's see, Sylvie says, I will share triggers with other players to put them on an even ground with the rest of us. That's a good point. Irene said, I don't like when another player calls attention to my hand or someone else's hand. Let them figure it out themselves. Absolutely, I agree 100%. Pamela says, makes, me, makes you wonder why they ask those types of questions. Hi, Nancy, welcome. If someone exposes a quint, yeah, and then everyone said, you know, kind of freaks out, the ooh and ah moment, but it, it puts everybody on guard. Some people, though, are so involved in their own hand that they don't even notice that a quint has been exposed. So Linda says, practice in the Mahjong school, but it isn't better than live play. So practicing in, in Mahjong school is a great way to get to know the new card because you can take your time and study the card while playing with robots. Another way to, to practice is to get your tiles out at home if you have a set and play solitaire. Do category modeling, do random pulls, Charleston modeling. Try even Charleston force where you pre-select categories and force hands in certain categories or maybe the categories that make you um, uncomfortable so that you can desensitize yourself from anxiety of playing, for example, a quint. Force yourself to play quints in exercises and that way when you have that opportunity in a live game with players, you can have more confidence playing that hand. Yep, there are a lot of hands with quints, more so than any other year that I have seen. Does anybody else have other things that they think about in regards to a losing streak? These are the things that I have thought about Uh, let's see, Chris is saying, do you red dot your card with Siamese? Yes, I do. I, any win I mark, even if it's with Siamese Mahjong. I feel like any win is a good win, and it's, it's hard fought. You don't, just be, I think just because you're playing two hands at once doesn't mean it's necessarily easy. It's actually quite challenging. Oh, 
Well, what is the, uh, Terry's asking, what is the red dot? The, it's, I call it the dot challenge, and this is where you mark your card with a dot, whether it's with a Sharpie or a sticker, anytime you win a hand and force yourself to play hands that you haven't won. Try to dot the whole card. Win every hand on the card in the given year. So, thought I had four points in this presentation. It was really uh, three. Rest, reassess, return. And just anytime you go on that losing streak and you start having a bad attitude, take a break, reassess, study, practice. Maybe not even think about playing Mahjong. And then when you return, remember your why, ease into the game, test different strategies, manage your expectations. Let's see, Marcia says, if you always keep your Mahjong money in the same little bag, switch to a different bag, cures the losing streak every time. Okay, <laughs> that's a good one. Uh, Cindy says, I've always, uh, let's see, I always reassess or um, backup hands before even playing during studying the card. The three R's of a losing streak, yes. Rest, reassess, return. Uh, let's see, Linda says, Michelle, if you're on a losing streak, should you avoid concealed hands? When I wouldn't avoid concealed hands, what I like to do, if I'm on a bad losing streak, I'll play consecutive run. Consecutive run is the most flexible category on the card because you have nine tiles and three suits. You do have flowers and you have a couple of dragon hands this year, but because you have nine tiles to work with and you can pick where to begin your sequence for, is it six of the seven hands? One, two, three, four, eight, eight hands, really nine if you consider the mixed suit option and the one suit, you know, big and little, that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, ten hands. So. The first two, though, on the first line is one through five or five through nine, so there's not a lot of flexibility there. But everywhere else, you can start your sequence at any number as long as it ends at nine. Because of that flexibility, that's where I focus. If I am on a losing streak, I'll try to focus on consecutive run. I would gather tiles that support the multiple in my hand that are consecutive around that multiple, four or five numbers in a range. And if I don't have multiples, then I focus on the predominant pattern. And that's where you're gonna look at, for example, do you have um, a, a single in there? Start from the single pair or something like that. So, or think about, do I have a flower? If I have a flower, there are two flower or three flower hands in here that I could focus on. So if you focus on the consecutive run category, you're gonna be more likely to be able to build a hand quickly because of all the number tiles that you're able to use and the flexibility with that category. So that's what I tend to do, focus on consecutive run. Let's see. I think I might have missed something. Similar hands between categories where there are shared multiples. That could be good as well. For example, if you're playing consecutive run and you're in one through four and you start getting six, eight, you could switch to using twos and fours, switch to evens. And that could apply also to odds. If you if you are playing, you know, five through nine and then you start getting a lot of big odds, you can switch to the odd tiles and leverage the multiples that are odds in your consecutive hand that maybe didn't come together. So there are commonalities, common multiples between categories. I call those tandems. Um, let's see, Make, uh, what did I miss? Make sure you're not hungry or tired when you start to play. It affects the reflexes. Okay, that's an interesting concept to think about. 
if that affects the way you play. Oh, thank you, Judy. Of course, if you missed any of it, it will, you can watch the repost for the presentation, and I can always post this in a PDF so you can look at it offline. Uh, Anne says she thinks the consecutive run category is harder this year than last year. I think that the there it is more challenging because you have um, a four. Uh, let's see, you have one, two. Besides the first hand, you have two four numbers in a range, and you have a five number in a range. So the the ranges are a little bigger and. It looks like, let's see, we have one, two, three, four, five one suit hands, so half and half, half one suit, half mixed suits, two dragon hands. I'm not sure if it's harder, but I think that there are a lot of options in consecutive run this year, 10 hands, if you count the options as two different hands. Um, let's see here. Uh, Sharon says, do you think the singles and pairs hands are more difficult than last year's card? I don't think so. I think they're equal, although the even and odd hand have more singles. So, and, and they're only 50 points, but there are more singles in there. Two, four, six, eight. I think those are going to be compared to last year's card. Let me just take a peek here. I got last year's card here. There were a couple of singles, but not as many. This year there are more singles with two hands than compared to last year's singles. So in, th in that regard, I think that those two hands are going to be a little more challenging. And then, of course, we have the big year hand, which is an 85-point hand. So I guess if you consider those two things yeah i think they are a little more difficult but one two three three of the seven i think are, are equal four of the of the seven i think might be a little harder and i guess you know that's a majority four out of seven so yeah i guess analyzing it that way i think so Uh, let's see, you have the flower jinx. Yes, I do. I have to make sure when I play that if I'm playing a hand with a pair of flowers, I need to make sure I have at least one flower. No more gap hands with flowers for me. That's going to be hard to do because I have a hard time getting flowers. i got to be able to play the hands with flowers. There are a lot of hands with flowers on this card. Uh, let's see. Thank you again, Judy. You got to see it from the beginning. Okay, excellent. Uh, Cindy says singles and pairs will determine if I go for a hand. A lot of hands seem to have them. I think so too. So you got to have your singles and pairs secured, especially if they're flowers or twos. Um, Evelyn says you find it interesting that some hands that were in one category last year migrated into other categories, namely the math category. Yeah, I was kind of surprised by that too. They had, for the longest time, they had a math play category as a separate category, and it's been addition for years. And all of a sudden, the math play are in evens and odds and it, they don't really follow, well, I suppose they follow a similar convention, but they, they really mix things up a little bit with the math play hands, with the idea of multiplication, four, six, and two, four, six, eight, and four, eight, or three, five, and one, five, and then five, seven, and three, five. I've been looking for opportunities to play those hands. I've played twice now. And I have not had an opportunity to play either of those options. So 
I don't know. I'm, I want to try to get those out of the way because I think those are going to be hard to get. Maybe when playing consecutive run, if they don't, if the tiles in the middle don't come in, consider switching to those hands. For example, if you're playing three, four, five consecutive run and you can't get fours, think about switching to three, five, the multiplication hand under odds. And also, if you're playing four, five, six and the fives don't come in, you could switch to evens with four, six. That would be using the tandem concept where you're using the same multiples from category to category. Katie says she thinks it's easier to get the single tiles this year in singles and pairs. I tried to do the 135 hand and it didn't come together. I don't recall what I switched to. I think I switched to 13579 in one suit. Maybe it was the mixed suit option. I don't remember, but I know I didn't win because I don't have a dot there. Oh, you know what? I did win. I, pl I was trying for the 13579 single and pair hand, and I built up multiples, so I switched to the one suit option, and I won. No pure math play hands. Okay, um, what do you, oh, pure math play. What do you mean, Pamela? No single, oh, I see, one suit. No single suit math play hands. They're all mixed suit. Yep. That's going to take some thinking right there because I think we're used to having one suit options. Uh, let's see. Still Kong 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 pair. Oh, the math play, the format, or the, the shape of the hand. Kong 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 singles. 2, 4, 4, 8, 1, 5, 3, 5. Cindy says she likes the third quint. You only need two jokers. Same with the fourth one, because you have two quints and two pairs. Uh, let's see. Uh, Katie says one three five is your favorite of the singles and pairs. Switch to closed one three five hand. Oh yeah, that's a good switch right there. That's a really good switch. Linda said, Michelle, which of your recent live plays were with the new card? I learned so much. Oh, thank you, Linda. Uh, let's see, the, the, we played in school games on Saturday night, so I guess that would be the fourth. And then we played the Let's Play live stream on Sunday night, so that would be the fifth. And that was regular games. So the next live stream, let's play live stream on the new card will be Thursday night. All quints need two jokers. Yes. No. The first quint has a, co a quint of flowers. You can have five flowers. So the first quint, technically, you would only really need one joker minimum. Because you can have five flowers. I don't think it happens all that often, but you can have five flowers there. And there's one quint that would require a joker, the number tile. Okay, let's see, Martha asks, how do you learn the tandem thing to switch from one hand to another? This is where you look at the common tiles between categories. So for example, the, the tandem for the year hands this year would be like numbers because there's twos all through there. So you can switch from the year category to like numbers using twos. Or because there are winds and dragons, you can also tandem with the wind and dragon category. If your year tiles don't come in, your twos, but you're getting a lot of winds or dragons, switch to the wind and dragon category and vice versa. The wind and dragon category can tandem with the year category and like numbers because it has winds, 
dragons, and it has two hands with like numbers. So that's an example there. Um, the the um, consecutive run category can tandem well with evens and odds because if you just drop tiles in your sequence, you can go either with evens or odds. For example, if you're playing one, two, three, four, and you're not getting ones and threes, you can maybe switch using your twos and fours and gather sixes and eights. Or if you're playing, uh, let's say you're playing six, seven, eight, nine, you can maybe switch to big odds with sevens and nines, or maybe even switch to three, six, nine with sixes and nines. So for the consecutive run category, when you're playing big numbers, you can maybe switch to big odds, consecutive run, and three, six, nine because of the sixes and the nines. So those make good tandem categories. I hope that helps. I think I cover that tandem concept in the card analysis, the new card analysis. There's a, a segment in there where I talk about tandems for each category on the card. I'll try to put a link to the spot in that presentation where I talk about tandems so you can find it easily. So I'll rewatch this and try to find that spot in the presentation so you can go there quickly. It's just, I think, uh, one, one page, um, a bulleted list of all the categories and what they can tandem with. Oh, Loretta's leaving. Bye, Loretta. Thank you for coming. Have a good night. Thank you so much for joining the Tabletop Live episode. Okay, so does anybody else have anything they want to add about handling a losing streak? My points are to, if you hit a space where your attitude is starting to affect your game, take a break, rest. While you're away resting, you want to reassess your skills, learn some new strategies, try to find where your weaknesses are and your strengths. When you're ready to return, you want to manage your expectations. Make sure you think about the luck factor because sometimes that luck factor can affect you and you can't control what happens at the table in regards to luck. If an, another player at the table is having a, a good lucky day, that could impact your game. So try to manage your expectations and don't take things personally. Don't be hard on yourself because of that element of luck. Just may not be your day. So uh, one of the things we talked about is Think about the things you can control, the things that you can't control, and manage your expectations accordingly so that you don't get hard on yourself. When you're ready to return, remember your why. Ease into the game. Try new strategies and manage your expectations. I hope this Tabletop Live episode helped you when it comes to losing streaks. Let's keep the conversation going under the video and maybe even continue it on Facebook because we might need to revisit this later in the year because we're, we'll go in and out of winning and losing streaks throughout the year. Uh, Maya says, she just wants to say Julia Rob Roberts' quote where she said, creating order out of chaos through a series of random uh, selections. Yep. Be a gracious winner, Marcia says. Excellent, I like that too. You're welcome, Cindy. Does anybody have any Closing thoughts on how to handle a losing streak. I think I'll, I'll continue researching this. One of the things that I looked at when I was studying this idea is poker players. What do poker players What do poker players do when they hit a losing streak? And that that was one of the things that kind of gave me inspiration 
when I personally hit a losing streak, rest, reassess, learn new strategies, come back with managed expectations, and don't get hard on myself because there's always an element of luck. Yeah, I saw the troll, Evelyn. <laughs> breathe. Helen says breathe. Oh, you're you're welcome, Linda. I hope it helps. Okay, let's see. It looks like Jingles had a question. Do you like the multiplication? I couldn't get them when I tried. I haven't even tried yet. Well, no, that's not true. I did look for an opportunity, but I think if I... If I don't have the singles, I just probably won't even think about it. I think I, I'd rather leverage multiples if I don't have those singles. So I think it's going to be about identifying the singles. So maybe train yourself to see 2, 4, 4, 8 for evens, those single tiles as part of that multiplication hand, and then for odds, 1, 5, and 3, 5. You're welcome, Maya. We've got another troll. Yes, we do. The bigger the channel gets, the more trolls we're going to get, is what I've heard. Oh, thank you, Marsha. All right. Well, if nobody has any more questions or comments about handling a losing streak, I think I'll go ahead and sign off. Thank you so much for my moderators. I really appreciate your help uh, with the questions and comments and even the troll that we had visiting tonight. Thank you so much for coming to the live stream, hanging out with us, and giving your input on how to handle a losing streak. This will be available in the repost, and if you're interested in the handout, I will make a PDF available upon request. Send me an email, and I'll send you a handout version of the presentation if you'd like. If you like this video, give me a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed to my channel, consider subscribing. Click that little gray bell if you do. That way you won't miss an opportunity to learn a new strategy or pick up an insight to the game that could give you an advantage at the table. Between now and the next episode of Table Talk Live, may all your picks be keepers. <laughs>